living in Louisiana as a single mother. Shireen Jackson ran a successful catering business and enjoyed the fruits of her labor. Infertility was a problem for 39-year-old Shireen, who wanted to grow her family and give her 10-year-old son Jamal a brother. Even after months of infertility treatments, Shireen's attempts were unsuccessful. With no partner or spouse and a strong desire to have a larger family, Shireen made the decision to look into adoption. With a ray of hope in her heart, Shireen welcomed the notion of adoption after being encouraged by a friend. Starting the adoption process required filling out a lot of papers, going through a lot of interviews, and having a background check done. Shireen persevered in her search for the ideal child to adopt despite the emotionally taxing and time-consuming nature of the process. Shireen was waiting impatiently for word of possible pairings. As the weeks stretched into months, she interacted with kids of all ages and backgrounds while visiting foster homes and orphanages. Subsequently, she met Tammy one day, a lovely six-year-old girl with golden locks and sparkling blue eyes. Shireen experienced a profound connection at that very instant. When she realized Tammy was the child she had been looking for the entire time. They clicked right away when they first met Tammy. As they got to know each other more, Tammy's vivacious personality started to come through. Without a doubt, Shireen believed that Tammy was her daughter. As the family walked out into the world, Shireen, eager to bring Tammy home, had to face harsh realities. Strangers' quiet murmurs and astonished looks were too much for Shireen to ignore. It became apparent that the adoption of a white child by a single African-American woman aroused interest and occasionally controversy. Shireen tried to ignore the critical glances and remarks. But her main priority was still providing Tammy with a caring and loving environment. But the questions and whispers only became louder. And soon their little town was buzzing with rumors. Doubtful rumors about Shireen's parenting skills and motivations for adopting a white child were spread by gossip mongers. Even though Tammy was deeply upset, Shireen remained unwavering in her resolve to provide her the life she deserved and refused to allow prejudice get in the way. Tammy was enrolled at the same school as Jamal by Shireen, who was unprepared for the following development. She was shocked to see that the principal and teachers were asking strange questions. There was a lot of curiosity about this blonde, blue-eyed girl staying with her. And Shireen was always having to explain Tammy's adoption. Shireen was frustrated. But doubts persisted. Every morning when Shireen dropped her kids off at school, she was met with judgmental looks from other parents, which made the problem worse. Harsh remarks, including doubting her authority to adopt Tammy, started to happen on a regular basis. Shireen had had enough of everyone's suspicions when the level of scrutiny and accusations reached a point where she was furious about the undeserved attention and couldn't believe some parents even questioned her decision. With one even asking, who does she think she is adopting that pretty little girl? Shireen couldn't understand why people were criticizing her and little Tammy and asking why she had been given the chance to adopt such a lovely child. She could not understand why they had doubts about her capacity to be a good mother because she was more than capable of giving Tammy everything she required, including the affection and attention that Tammy so obviously sought. One morning, something really upsetting happened to Shireen, who had never comprehended the depth of people's brutality. There was a tap on the door, upsetting Shireen, Jamal, and Tammy as they were getting used to their new schedule. When Shireen opened it, she saw two stern-looking people who said they were social workers. They clarified that they had received an anonymous report about Tammy's adoption. 
As she opened the door for them, Shireen's heart raced. Wondering why or how someone might have reported them. The social workers started a thorough investigation and asked. Shireen a lot of private and bothersome questions. They probed her work. Support network. Relationship history. And financial status. Shireen felt like she was being studied and condemned. And she thought that everything in her life was being looked at closely. She couldn't help but wonder who the anonymous tipper was in the midst of the investigation. Shireen did her best to cooperate in spite of the difficult circumstances. Trying to keep her cool for Tammy and Jamal's benefit. But inside, she was filled with resentment and rage. It was obvious that someone had picked her out on purpose. With the intention of making her life miserable. Shireen's only wish had been to start a family. But it seemed like everyone else was against her desire to do so. The social workers revealed the nature of the anonymous information. They had received as the questioning went on. They were told that Shireen was supposedly involved in unlawful activities and had a criminal record. Shireen was shocked by the charges and fiercely refuted them. Presenting proof of her innocence. The social workers gave off the impression that they were dubious. But they promised her that they would look into the situation more. Thoroughly before taking any action. Shireen was devastated at the idea of someone purposefully. Attempting to destroy their devoted family because she. Was afraid of losing Tammy. Whom she had come to love profoundly. And she knew that Jamal had developed a close relationship with. His younger sister. Shireen felt that this was an extremely unjust position in which she now had to prove herself to these authorities. As the narrative progresses, Shireen's life took a wild turn during the next few days. She sought to keep Tammy away from the chaos, juggling the stress of the investigation with the need to maintain her business. Still, the young girl sensed something wasn't quite right. As rumors swept through the neighborhood, Shireen found herself the target of mockery and criticism from some of her closest friends and acquaintances. She was alone and felt deceived, wondering who she might trust. However, the struggle was far from ended. When Shireen heard a loud knock at her door a week later, Jamal questioned why the cops were there as she went to answer it. When Shireen opened the door and saw two Louisiana, police department officers. Her eyes widened in shock. Shireen promptly ordered the children to go to their rooms as they asked to be let inside. Her heart pounding. She asked the officers how she could be of use. Subsequently, the officers made a shocking announcement, stating that they had gotten a tip regarding a kidnapping and that Shireen was purportedly connected to the missing girl. Shireen was stunned and attempted to process the seriousness of the kidnapping charge. She had legally adopted Tammy. But how could anyone believe she had abducted her? Trying to stay composed. Shireen inhaled deeply. Shireen's voice quivered with a mixture of dread and annoyance. Officers. I didn't kidnap Tammy. She's my daughter. Legally adopted through the proper channels. I have all the documentation to prove it. Shireen stated. In an attempt to dispel the unfounded accusation. Shireen quickly went to fetch the adoption records. When the police asked to see them. Shireen waited nervously for their response while the detectives. Went through the paperwork. She wondered if the anonymous tip to the social workers had also. Been given to the police as her thoughts turned back to their visit. The investigators finally completed going over the records. After what seemed like a lifetime. They looked at one other for a moment. Then back at Shireen. The last detective to say. Everything seems to be in order. Was the detective. We'll need to verify this information. But for now. We don't have any reason to believe Tammy's in danger. Shireen felt a wave of relief. 
but she knew the fight was far from finished. Hoping the police would identify her malevolent accuser. She said. Can you find out who made the false report? The other detective gave her the assurance. We'll try our best to find the source of the tip. It's a serious offense to file a false report. And if we find them. They will face consequences. After the detectives left. Shireen collapsed onto her couch. Exhausted both emotionally and intellectually. Her world seemed to be falling apart around her. And she was concerned about what would happen to her kids. How could she keep their innocent hearts safe and shield them? From all this drama, Shireen developed hypervigilance in the days that followed. Questioning everyone around her and always looking over her shoulder. Despite the ongoing investigation in the community known as Treatment Shireen, the once consoling supportive community now appeared to be a minefield of betrayal and mistrust. Still, Shireen never wavered in her devotion to her family, giving Jamal and Tammy lots of affection in an attempt to keep their lives as normal as possible. But the strain took a toll on her career. Her once thriving catering firm started to falter. Shireen was keen to achieve her previous level of accomplishment. Shireen was cooking dinner one evening when she got an unexpected call from a lawyer claiming to know who was making the bogus charges. Shireen accepted a meeting even though she was dubious. The attorney brought over an envelope containing correspondence and phone conversations, implying that someone close to her may be involved. The attorney gave Shireen a cryptic word of caution. As Shireen looked through the records, her pulse raced because they mentioned a friend who had a falling out and had turned sour. That someone she'd once trusted could go to such lengths was unthinkable. Equipped with this fresh data, Shireen decided to consult a lawyer and pursue legal action. She was adamant about clearing her identity and protecting her family from additional harm. Shireen's battle for justice took place in the courtroom. The false accusations breadth and the suffering they had inflicted upon her family were made clear during the trial. Witnesses came out to attest to Shireen's moral fiber and her resolve to be a devoted and caring mother. After some time, the truth was revealed, and the author of the anonymous reports was identified. The erstwhile friend, Militia Arnold, confessed to her evil deeds and the courtroom gasped in shock. Shireen won her case in court, and the accusations against her were withdrawn. The wounds from the experience persisted. Nevertheless, even after the court's decision, Shireen had experienced a great deal of emotional turmoil, and her kids had to deal with mistrust and bigotry. Shireen and her family began the healing process in the weeks that followed. Her faith in people was greatly bolstered by the assistance of those who had stood with her during her darkest hours. She also made new friends. Two, people who accepted her for the kind mother she was. Regardless of color or situation, they agreed that she was Tam's and Jamal's greatest mother. Shireen's determination to create a society in which acceptance and love are the norm was strengthened by this encounter. Driven by her experience, Shireen Turn became an adoption evangelist, working with groups to spread the word about the benefits of creating diverse families. The gossip and criticism eventually subsided over time, and Shireen's catering company started to prosper once more. She got even closer to Jamal and Tammy after emerging from the storm, having grown stronger and wiser. That's all about the first story and now let's watch another similar story. In this video, you will hear a gripping story about love and unanticipated decisions. Savor the next tale that is coming up. Diana struggled through the unappealing rain and muck on the station grounds. Her feet ached. And she was plagued by a splitting headache. All she wanted was some peace and quiet. Away from the constant ringing of worried locals and obnoxious. 
migrant workers attempting to register illegally at aliases. Diana was a 28-year-old district officer. A very unusual position. Diana sat down, stretched her tired legs, and poured hot coffee from her thermos when she finally had a moment. As she sipped the hot tea, she thought back to her earlier years. Diana was taken to an orphanage at night when she was three years old. Not from birth. Her parents were nowhere to be found. Even with her immaculate appearance and long hair adorned. With big white bows, the child had no paperwork. All she had was a torn picture of herself and an unknown hand. Diana could only say that she loved her father and mourned him. Terribly when people asked about her last name or the identities of her parents. Diana didn't have the best upbringing in the orphanage. She frequently endured abuse at the hands of older kids and cunning boys. She acquired the ability to repel wrongdoers early on and grew to have a strong sense of justice that made her intolerable to theft and lying. Since she was young, she has continuously battled for her rights. Teachers constantly chastised her, telling her to shut up and threatening to twist his ear off because she was a girl. But the tenacious little girl would not give up, saying, He's a thief. He stole my pen. And I saw it. Let him confess and give it back. And then I'll let him go. By adolescence. Everyone knew that if Diana caught someone in the act, it was preferable to confess voluntarily. Despite concerns about justice. If not, she would seek the truth with all her might and would not hesitate to use force if needed. Numerous boys would vehemently and defensively remark. You should only work for the cops. It's perfect. Diana was a gifted student who worked hard in her studies. Achieved academic success. Dreamed of going to police academy. And won prizes. The headmistress. Veronica. Decided to stand with Diana. The orphan girl met all requirements brilliantly and was able to acquire full-time training thanks to her husband's powerful position. Diana attracted the attention of many male classmates with her startling beauty, black, sleek hair, brown eyes with a mesmerizing swirl, and a faultless model figure, but she was so concentrated on her academics that she didn't entertain ideas of romance or socializing. She brushed off the boys' attempts with ease and remained unmoved. Beyond schooling, she was helped with housing so she wouldn't wind up in a troublesome apartment. Diana easily secured a position as an ordinary operative, joining a seasoned squad that was predominantly male. At first, the pretty, long-legged girl was ridiculed by seasoned operative Dustin, who didn't really take her seriously. Oh. Diane. You shouldn't have chosen this profession. It's not a woman's job to catch criminals. You'll have to wear out more than one pair of shoes. Examining blood. And dirt. It's nothing good. You'll get sick of all that. You should transfer to the archives or some other paperwork. Why do you need all this? I don't understand. You're a girl. You should think about hectares and clothes. Not mess around with the stiffs. But the girl obstinately turned her head and said. I won't get bored. Dustin. I've been dreaming of this job since I was a little girl. You'll see. I'll try. And I won't let you down. Just take me with you to the real crime so I can get some practice. The man simply waved his hand. She was first just allowed to handle filing and organizing paperwork. She refrained from taking on the riskier facets of the work. However, due to a severe staffing shortage, Diana was forced to return to operational work after an experienced operator. Dexter fractured his leg and had to take a long sick leave. She would never forget the raid on the drug house. The moment she saw the eerie image of slashed hands and empty eyes, 
She was surprised to see a young man pass away instantly from bad habit. She saw how attractive. Youthful people from wealthy backgrounds were succumbing. To bad addictive habit. Despite the difficulties. Her co-workers respected the way she deftly disarmed crooks. Suffered through hours of ambush just like everyone else and never once voiced complaints about the cold, hunger, or feeling helpless. She was like a sponge, carefully remembering every little detail. Diana, respected and regarded as one of their own, got together over a chilly cup of coffee with her co-workers to talk about the impending surgery. Her insights were respected and she frequently offered original and imaginative suggestions. She took a particular interest in one of the operatives, Alex, and a bond of sympathy was swiftly formed. Tall and athletic, with blue eyes and blonde hair, Alex was often complimenting her and, almost by accident, reaching out to grasp her hand when they were having a conversation. Diana enjoyed the attention especially considering how handsome Alex looked. But everybody knew that Alex had been married for a long time and had two small children. Despite having frequent arguments and an uneventful marriage, he confided in his co-workers that he continued the union since his fiancée became pregnant. Despite his circumstances, Alex showed Diana how much he cared about her by giving her a bouquet of roses and even driving her home. Diana struggled not to give in to the temptation. But she had fallen passionately in love with Alex and her heart was no longer hers. She was experiencing an unbelievable sensation. Every time he touched her, butterflies fluttered in her tummy and her entire body trembled. He abruptly showed up at her place one night, half drunk and furiously ringing the doorbell. Diana, wearing a slender, luminous nightgown, opened the door, startled and still asleep. She was concerned and asked, What's the matter? Have you been drinking? He went stealthily into her apartment, shut the door, turned to face her, and gave her a long, intense kiss. Dan tried to pull away, and she caught her breath whispering hurriedly, Alex, honey, you cannot, what are you doing, it's not right, we mustn't wake up, I'm scared, but the man didn't seem to be able to contain himself, he gave her a bare hug, his body aching to squeeze her bones, don't drive me away, my love, I beg you, I cannot live without you, I think of you day and night. I love you. Do you hear? I love you like a madman. Like a boy. I'd do anything for you. Why are you shaking so much? Don't be afraid. Kitten. I won't hurt you. I will be gentle. You are my joy. He whispered. Covering her neck with kisses. The girl was overcome with emotion and was unable to resist, giving in to an overwhelming, all-consuming passion. They were unable to tear themselves apart from one another that night, and neither of them slept for even a moment. Their covert relationship blossomed into something ferocious and intense. The joyful, affectionate glances, gestures, and love vibes betrayed them despite their best efforts to hide their emotions at work. The department as a whole soon learned about their romance. When Alex's wife learned about the allegations and became enraged, she hurried to the department head, sparking a disastrous controversy that further inflamed the issue. She insisted that the young worker having the affair be fired, right away out of embarrassment. Given that Alex had declared his love for her alone and that he was purportedly in the process of divorcing his marriage. Diane found herself in a desperate predicament, hoping that she and Alex were genuine. After the public scandal, 
there was a discernible change. He put up a well-groomed facade as a model family. Man and deliberately avoided Diane. Hiding his guilty conscience. Diane. On the other hand. Lost a lot of weight. Was emotionally spent. And wept non-stop. Things quickly got out of hand in the department. Which resulted in a run-in with her supervisor. Her boss had been about to chastise her for being involved in a love affair that had upset another family. But after witnessing the incredibly distraught and desirous young woman in front of him, his opinion changed. He could not have been more empathetic. So instead of criticizing her, he told her that her work was great but that she had to stop working with Alex. He emphasized the difficult nature of the task and the criminal atmosphere on the periphery when suggesting a transfer to the police department. He was certain that she could manage the inconvenience, noting that she needed time to recover from the emotional injuries brought on by the current circumstances. The supervisor urged her to think about her well-being and expressed concern that Alex would leave his family for her, warning of possible complaints and problems. Diane accepted the offer right away, even though she was first embarrassed by the private conversation. She felt grateful for the opportunity. Despite the difficulties that lay ahead, she saw this transfer as a means out of the tragic love. Triangle that she was locked in. She told herself over and over again to forget about Alex. Her heart and soul. Nevertheless. Still ached for him. As a result, she accepted a position in law enforcement. Albeit at first she was intimidated by the idea of handling drunk people, controlling rowdy drunks, and handling different types of disruptions. This included providing consolation to ladies in distress, residents perplexed by alleged crimes, undocumented migrants living in cramped dwellings, and the homeless in need of transportation to sobering up facilities. She had to wake up early and stay up late because of her workload, which made her feel gloomy and lightheaded. She eventually adopted a customized strategy for every case, fully participating in her work in spite of extreme exhaustion. She was surprised to learn that a large number of retirees wanted a chance to voice their complaints about life and the government in addition to receiving justice for their transgressions. Likewise, even with newly opened wounds, battered wives frequently stood up for their abusers when it came to calling the police. Thoughts of Alex seemed to be temporarily set aside amid the daily commotion. But nights brought a return of pain. The three words that kept repeating in her head were, I love you but she fought the temptation to reach out to him. At the station one ordinary workday, she was approached by a friendly middle-aged man, wearing an extravagant cashmere coat. He looked respectable and well-groomed. The young woman introduced herself as Diana and expressed her pleasure at the meeting. While the stranger introduced himself, saying, Good morning. My name is Hector. I'm a surgeon at the local hospital here in the neighborhood, playing the part of the local doctor. She asked him what he was there for and hinted that it might have to do with reporting a crime. He cleared his throat and replied, Yes. That's right. I live in a private house on the outskirts. And next door, there's been a large abandoned house that was empty for a long time. Now. It's inhabited by homeless people. And there's complete mayhem, drunkenness. Shouting. This is out of line. Measures need to be taken. Or soon it will be scary to go home. And I'm worried about my property. I'm rarely at home. But these people might steal something and drink it away. They have no other occupations. Diana acknowledged receiving the report and gave him her word that she would investigate. Calvin, her co-worker who drives the police car, acknowledged the difficult circumstances and offered his condolences. 
he said he would come with her. That it could be less scary with him there. But Diana, ever the fighter, shook her head, said no, and thanked Calvin. She explained that her experiences after leaving the orphanage had made her resilient and that she was no longer terrified of the homeless. Relentlessly, she made her way to the given address, where she could hear people yelling and swearing up to a mile away. She could see the tumultuous scene as she got closer, ragged people standing about among the rubble. Approaching the scene with unshakable conviction, Diana saw two women and three homeless guys. Having an orgy while intoxicated, she called herself Police Lieutenant Diana and yelled angrily for silence. She holstered her pistol and threatened to take swift action for any provocative gesture. She spoke to them in a firm manner, demanding that they pack up and go. She also emphasized that the neighbors had complained and that they could face repercussions, such as 15 days in jail for disorderly conduct. Diana quickly controlled one of the vagrants who was threatening her by twisting his arms behind his back. The others went silent, begging for forgiveness as she repeated her threat. They clarified that they turned to drinking as a coping method since they had nowhere else to go. One said that the day before, their tent, which offered some warmth, had burned down. Amidst the chaos, Diana's gaze fell upon an antiquated, yellowed picture hanging on the wall. She picked it up, wiped it off, and gave it a close inspection after realizing what it was. She was shocked to see that the old, faded picture was the identical one she had in the orphanage. The ripped photo showed her sitting on a woman's knee and giving someone a hug with her other arm. A child's frock, which appeared to be the opposite half of the same photo she had retained, was exposed by the torn edge. She realized there were two girls who looked like identical twin sisters. Diana wondered if the woman in the picture was actually her mother. She studied the features intently, finding nothing that reminded her of herself. She shook her fingers and turned the picture over, looking for a hint in the writing. But the ravages of time and humidity had made the writing unrecognizable. Diana was confused and felt that there were a lot of unresolved questions. Whose residence was it? Was she here when she was born? Why and by whom was she placed in an orphanage? A further layer of intrigue was created by the ripped photograph that was tucked inside her dress pocket. She rummaged through the heap of abandoned goods nearby. But other than a few kids' clothes and shoes, she couldn't find anything substantial. With open jaws, the homeless people watched Diana's desperate hunt and exchanged low chuckles at her cost. Even though they laughed, they didn't say anything because of the divisional severe manner. Unfazed, Diana made the decision to spend the night with the homeless people at the sobering up facility rather than expose them to the elements. After that, she started looking for information on the abandoned house's owner. She also made the decision to see her neighbor, the surgeon who had first reported the incident to the precinct. In an effort to solve the riddle, she was invited inside his house when she arrived. They took up residence in a tidy and cozy kitchen, while the surgeon busied himself making tea and setting out some basic snacks. During their talk, Diana said, I've taken action based on your application. Diana turned to Hector and told him how urgent it was to find the owner of the abandoned house after guiding the homeless people away with their word to depart. She added that having been an orphan herself, she saw this as a unique chance to learn the truth about her origins and that she had discovered something there that was connected to her past. But Hector shrugged, saying he could do nothing to help. He revealed that the property had been abandoned F.O. our years and that he had only recently moved to the region. 
around six months ago. Then Hector opened up about a trying time in his own life. He used to live in the capital with his family and was a well-known thoracic surgeon who had months-long wait. Lists for surgeries that even drew in well-known artists. His enjoyment was suddenly cut short. Though, when a drunk motorist struck and put an end to his wife and daughter, Anna, as they were on their way back from school, Hector was devastated and could no longer live his life the way he had been. Enduring both mental and physical suffering. Torn apart. He sold everything. Left his work. And relocated to this place. Hector took comfort in his new home's memories of his former life. He hated the capital for stealing his closest friends and family. And he craved a new beginning free from questioning prying eyes. As a result, he continued to be unknown to the neighborhood and kept his traumatic past private. Diana discovered that her hands had gradually returned to normal, enabling her to function properly. Feeling slightly encouraged by Hector's account, Hector recommended that they see Max, an old hand who had spent his whole life in the neighborhood, and might know something about the family who had previously lived in the house next door. Diana thanked the physician and determined to learn the truth about her origins and family. Went to Max's location. An elderly guy who appeared haggard and hunted emerged from the little immaculate residence when the door opened. He asked her if something had happened in a creaking voice. She introduced herself as Diana, the divisional officer and told Max that she was trying to find out who had lived in the abandoned house on the outskirts before assuring him that it was a private affair. Knowing Max had lived there for a long time, she thought he could recognize the proprietors. After guiding her inside, the elderly man started talking about his memories as they sat on the sofa. Max recalled how gorgeous the house had been more than 20 years ago with panoramic windows, a neatly tidied attic, and a massive pergola in the backyard. Living there was a husband and wife team of well-known local business people, the Terracans, who ran a profitable chain of bakeries. Max thought back to their wonderful pastries and contrasted them with what's available now. He said that Mr. Terracan was a severe, unaccommodating, an obstinate man and mentioned that rival bakers had made multiple attempts to acquire the businesses. Mr. Terrican refused to back down from his belief that the bakeries were a family business, even in the face of multiple offers from rivals to buy them out. His wife, Antonina, was quite the opposite of his severe manner. She frequently gave her neighbors apples and cherries since she was kind cheerful, and compassionate with them. The Terracan couple struggled to conceive and had multiple failed efforts before deciding to become parents. Antonina eventually became pregnant and gave birth when she was over 40. But the experience was hampered by issues that required frequent hospital stays. While Antonina was on maternity leave at this period, Mr. Terracan found it difficult to manage the responsibilities of his company with his worry for his hospitalized wife. He was in a tough predicament, anxious that this time, catastrophe should spare his family. Diana asked Max if the woman in the photo was Antonina as she showed him the discovered photo, her hands trembling with excitement. The old guy, however, shook his head and made it clear that he did. In fact, remember the Terracans having two twin girls. Based on a mole under her eye, he surmised that the woman in the photo might be Linda, one of the twins. Regretfully, problems occurred during the twins' birth, and Antonina's prior health issues prevented her from surviving childbirth. Weary and distraught, Spencer took custody of his daughters and tried to raise them while managing the responsibilities of his job. Feeling overwhelmed, 
He confided in Max about how hard it was to handle everything. And in the end. He followed Max's suggestion to employ a nanny. Despite having the money to do so. Spencer had trouble locating nannies who could. Provide the twins with the necessary care. Which resulted in multiple caregiver changes. The scenario took a sad turn when a new nanny. Arrived when Diana and Linda were three years old. Regretfully. Max was unable to meet this nanny since Spencer. Terracan passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. Following that. The children and the nanny vanished into thin air. Shocking the neighborhood. When word of the case spread. Authorities conducted a thorough investigation. That involved searching basements. Combs through woods. Checks of barns and inspections of sewer manholes. The children's whereabouts remained a mystery despite intensive searches. And the house was ultimately abandoned. After rivals acquired the company, the Terracan family was buried in a cemetery outside of the city next to a large willow tree. Max shared that as a young man, he would often go to the cemetery to remember and take care of his neighbor's graves. He did, however, acknowledge that it had been five years and that he had gotten weak. Diana discovered she had a sibling after being astounded by Max's in-death narrative of her parents' life. She told the old guy to take care of himself as she said him farewell. Overwhelmed with grief, she was trembling outside, not even realizing that the wind and rain were blowing. She turned her face towards the weather as she thought about the intricate web of her family's secret. Determined to find the truth, Diana followed up on her newly discovered lead and coincidentally discovered the link that would solve her family's riddle. The only thing on her thoughts was how to locate her sister, who had been gone for a long time. Diana experienced a deep sense of optimism and connection at learning of her sister's existence. She realized that she was no longer alone in the world when she considered having her own small family member. Diana couldn't believe her good fortune and, motivated by the prospect of a reunion, set out to actively hunt for her sister the following day. In an attempt to locate any references to Linda Tereshina, she painstakingly went through old reports and archives. But no matter how hard she searched, there were no hints to be uncovered. Diana was close to giving up since it felt like her search had come to a standstill. At this moment, she looked again at the back of the old picture and got an idea. Diana went to her operational department and asked Bruce, a handwriting specialist, for assistance. Bruce worked his magic on the illegible inscription. She was shocked when he cracked it and revealed the Names Diana and Linda along with Nanny Veronica. Diana concluded that Nanny Veronica could hold the key to solving the mystery surrounding her and her sister's disappearance after receiving a vital lead from this. Working with other detectives and passport office staff, Diana was able to immediately identify the woman with the unusual double name. Two weeks later, in a nearby town, Diana stood nervously but resolutely on the doorstep of Nanny Veronica's apartment. She was met by an elderly, run-down-looking woman dressed elegantly and expensively. As she pressed the doorbell, Grandma, and who is it? said the five-year-old kid standing next to her, holding a toy hurting thing. The hostess, who looked like a mother but had different hair and attire, started asking the guest's name. Soaked. He just managed to say hello to Diana when she came in. The women moved softly into the hallway, expecting a serious, long talk. Max was told to pass the time playing in his room. With a heavy heart, Veronica started to talk. She talked about how she had been waiting for this to happen and acknowledged having a sneaking suspicion that it would 
she expressed regret and admitted that she was to blame for interfering with Diana and her sister's lives. Veronica said that she felt bad for the effect that placing children in an orphanage years prior had on their lives. She was so embarrassed that she broke down in tears and found it difficult to express herself. Distraught. Diana silently pleaded with her to reveal the truth. Stressing how she had no idea who she was and just had a piece of a picture in her pocket. With a heavy heart, Veronica confessed that she had been employed by Diana's father's rivals 25 years prior. Diana's parents, the Terracons, operated a prosperous family bakery using custom recipes. The competitors had dispatched Veronica under the guise of a nanny in order to win people over and eventually take the kids, knowing that Diana's father would stop at nothing to keep his daughter alive. The scheme was designed to coerce her into signing a contract and selling the profitable company for a low price. I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to come across as a callous guy. But he refused to take a stand. I simply consented to take part in this scam in order to benefit financially. My mother was fighting cancer at the time. And I had the obligation of taking care of her. They assured me that they would cover the cost of my pricey, and very expensive, prescription drugs and help me have treatment abroad. I'm not trying to defend what I did. But I gave in to their intimidation and pressure. I felt trapped in life at that point. Scared for my own health as well as for my mother. Who was dependent only on me. I got along well with you. And Spencer got the job for me with ease. It was more than just business. I could tell you too. Especially Linda. We're missing your motherly love. Diana. You came across as more stubborn and strong-willed than your father did. I promised to show you a lot of toys and give you a cat. So I took you and your sister to the playground on the scheduled day. After that. I got you in the car and took off. It seemed strange. Yet everything seemed to go well. I made myself at home with you at an abandoned kids camp. And you didn't seem to mind at all. Seeing it all as a game. The rivals did not waste any time in telling my father that. The children had been abducted and were being held as ransom. But then something unexpected happened. As soon as Spencer realized his daughters were missing. He had a severe heart attack and passed away. It transpires that he had a protracted medical history of heart issues. After this terrible incident. Nobody was sure what to do for your future. Even though the extortionists had not planned for the sudden. Passing away of the bakery owner. They were reluctant to put an end to him. They gave me an order to put an end to the girls however. I saw fit since they didn't want to deal with the messiness of another ending. There would be no more issues because the girls had to vanish. They made it my responsibility and said I would never. See my mother alive again if I didn't comply. I dropped you and your sister off in two different orphanages. Just so you know. You were three years old at the time. Weeping and clinging to your father. Unable to accept his departure from this life. You begged me not to go. Saying that I was a very special person. I had grown attached to you during that period. And it broke my heart. But with all the attention this case had received. I could not have kept you because I would have been caught. Despite my meeting every requirement set forth by those people. They refused to help my ailing mother. She endured agonizing suffering before passing away at a hospice. These bad people met their passing in the 1990s. When they clashed with merchant. After six months. My conscience was like a hot iron. Tormenting me every day. I thought about the two of you a lot in my dreams. And regret made me resolve to come back. One of you. I intended to take with me and nurture as my daughter. I was unable to become a parent because of the mistakes. I made when I was younger. Why I picked Linda over you may be a mystery to you. 
It is simple. Of the two of you. Linda was the sicker and weaker one. You were healthy and strong even as a newborn. While she would not have made it through an orphanage. You should be aware of the great mental and financial. Toll that I had to take in order to carry out this plan covertly. And keep no one in the dark about it. The situation created a great deal of agitation, but I was helped by a generous relative who was employed by the Board of Guardians. She helped with the adoption process, knowing that I was childless, and Linda became my legal daughter. To be honest, I needed some time to get used to not feeling like a mother right away. But despite all of the difficulties, hospital stays and continued therapy. As the days went by, I began to fall madly in love with her. She became my favorite little person and ceased to be just family. I gave her a first-rate education and reared her with respect. Max, my grandchild, was born to Linda, who chose an affluent family for her spouse. Diana, I have to come clean about my guilt. I was hesitant to take the chance of bringing you two together. I was worried about the possible publicity. And Linda, our main character, was in disbelief and finding it difficult to process and understand everything. She only had questions regarding her sister and how much she wanted to visit her. Then the door opened and Linda, who looked a much like Diana, stepped out onto the threshold. The same cheek dimples, darker complexion, and brown eyes. The only thing that stood out was Linda's fashionable hairstyle and her postpartum weight gain. Linda remarked, Mom, who is that girl? We look exactly alike. Like a carbon copy. She was taken aback by Diana's presence. The woman let out a deep breath and spoke candidly saying, it's your own sister. Diana. Linda. Please sit down. I need to confess everything and tell you the truth at last. I know you may hate me after this. But I can no longer carry it all inside me. Especially now that there is nothing to hide. The sisters gave each other a tight hug and started crying. As they were hugging. They both remembered a memorable incident from their early years. They had cried and hugged in the camp, which was completely deserted to children. And they had felt the warmth of a loved one's hands. During that poignant time, Daya revealed to her sister the same fragment of a picture that she had treasured throughout her early years, discovered in her dress pocket upon being sent to the orphanage. She stated her strong wish to find a soul mate and know that she was not alone in this world. Since the mystery of whose hand she was clutching in the photo had haunted her for years. It happened at last. Sis. I'm so happy I discovered you. Honey. Linda gave her sister a gentle pat on the back and whispered. Diana. I can imagine what you went through there in the orphanage. It's like a gift from fate. As the two sisters grieved. However. How did it occur? Why did you live with my mother? When I was living in an orphanage. She placed you there. But why? Don't be silent. Mom. Make a statement. Linda persisted in asking Veronica questions after she. Became unable to take the stillness any longer. Veronica is not your mother. She blurted out. Unable to take it any longer. She took us from the house while working as our babysitter. Our parents had passed away a long, long time ago. It was merely a horrible coincidence if my mother passed away during childbirth. Then Veronica was involved in my father's case. Daddy fell victim to a heart attack as soon as he learned we had been taken. It's really frightening. And I still don't know how to process it. Not only were you raised by a stranger. Linda. But you were raised mostly by the person who. Was involved in our father's demise. 
It's astounding. Linda's face changed. And she asked. Is it true you're not my mother? Staring at Veronica in terror. Did you truly kidnap my dad and take us away? Who believe you to be? For how long did you act like you were my mother? You claimed to love me more than life. But you never mentioned my sister's existence or the pain she endures in an orphanage. How were you able to? How on earth are you able to achieve this? Veronica was at a loss. Unsure of how to justify herself. Overwhelmed with shame. She sobbed and grabbed her daughter by the hem of her dress. Saying. Pardon me. Linda. I was coerced and blackmailed by bad people. They said they would pay for my mother's medical care overseas if I accepted. Because she was ill. I had to assist her. You decided to help your mother and ruin other people's lives. Leave her children orphaned. And steal them. Linda said. Refusing to be calmed down. I detest you. Are you following? You man. You monster. Are frightening. I refuse to spend even a moment in this house. Max. Put on some clothes. Diana. Let's go. Little sister. Your aunt and I are heading to our house. Daddy misses us there. Linda exclaimed. Allow me to present my spouse. Kleb. You'll like him. He's a good guy. We have reached the end of our options here. She split up my own family and claimed to be my mother. And I don't want anything to do with her. I could never have imagined anything like it. I am at a loss for words when it comes to explaining everything to my husband. Veronica sobbed. Realizing that her daughter and grandson. Who had been her life's purpose and the light in the window for so long. Were gone forever. She couldn't imagine how she would live without them. Her girls could hardly forgive her because she had caused them too much grief. But maybe they could forgive her in the future. Diana met Eric. Who was just as shocked as Linda to learn that his mother-in-law. Wasn't actually his mother-in-law. The sisters spent several hours clearing weeds from. The tombstones as they looked for their parents' graves. Eventually. They found the pictures of mom and dad. To which Linda muttered. Hello. Mommy. Yes. We have had a chance to meet. We didn't know anything. Which is why we haven't visited you all these years. Diana sobbed till she passed out and collapsed into the gravestone. Mommy. I found you. She said. I know who I am now. Even if it's here and you're not with me. I'm grateful that you gave your life to provide my sister and me. Sweetheart. Even if it cost you. You know. Daddy. I kind of remember your voice and hands. Max. I learned from your neighbor how much of a wonderful man. You were and how much you looked out for us. Daddy. You left with worries about what was ahead for our family. If you were still here. We wouldn't have had to part from Diana. And she wouldn't have gone to live in an orphanage. Linda comforted her sister. I hate Veronica now. After what I've learned. I can't even bring myself to call her mother. But now that we're back together. My sister and I are resolved never to be separated from one another. In recognition of the great sorrow you underwent. We intend to erect a brand new. Exquisite monument in your honor. Diana said she was proud to have parents like them. Even though our destiny has been difficult. We commit to leading honorable lives and making sure. The Tarakan family is not embarrassed by our actions. Farewell. Dear friends. We will meet again. Diana told Linda. Reflecting on how much they resembled their father with black. Hair and brown eyes but shared their mother's smile and dimples. The sisters embraced once more. Shedding tears of both sorrow and joy. Their hearts were intertwined with the happiness of. 
reuniting with their sister and the sadness of never seeing their parents again. Despite their animosity towards Veronica, who had unwittingly or willingly caused so much unhappiness and destruction, Diana resolved to restore her parents' house, making it her ancestral home. With work conveniently close by, there would be no need for an arduous commute. Linda, on the other hand, promptly rejected the inheritance. She and her husband were living comfortably with a mansion and a summer house, lacking nothing. Before making such decisions, the sisters had to endure numerous challenges and legal battles. For their rightful inheritance, they underwent genetic testing to confirm their parentage. And Diana presented an old case in court proving that they were the daughters of the deceased businessmen. As for Veronica, they chose deliberate silence, primarily due to the expiration of the statute of limitations, and she would no longer be anything. Secondly, it turns out that Linda raised Max admirably. Despite their sins and shady dealings, it took a long time for Linda to find the strength to forgive Veronica. Max played a significant role. He didn't want to understand anything and eagerly awaited pies at his grandmother's door, showing great affection for her. Reluctantly, Linda had to bring Max to grandma's, initially without much communication. Gradually, they began to exchange a few phrases. Veronica didn't ask for anything. She just looked into her daughter's eyes resembling a wounded dog. Eventually, Linda's compassionate nature prevailed, and she hugged Veronica warmly, whispering, Mama, I forgive you. No matter what you were or the trouble you caused, you sincerely loved, cared for, and provided the best for me. I probably have no right to judge you. Veronica fell to her knees raised her hands to heaven, and began to wail, thanking her daughter and asking for forgiveness again. She saw Linda as the light in the window for her and for Diana. Linda helped Veronica up, urging her to stop self-torment. She reminded her that the past couldn't be undone, and encouraged them to live in the present. Linda assured Veronica that she and Max wouldn't leave her, promising to visit and talk to her. She comforted Veronica, urging her to believe in good things. Meanwhile, Diana decided to rebuild their home. Seeing it as the right thing to do, she initiated the restoration with enthusiasm, hiring a team of workers to rebuild the ancestral home. Hector, the surgeon who lived next door, was delighted to have such a charming neighbor. From the time he saw her at the station, he fell deeply in love with the girl. After his wife passed away, he had stopped being interested in women's sex. But he was drawn to this brown-eyed beauty, so much so that he took an active role in helping her, supervising the job, giving estimates, and giving advice on what kind of materials to buy. In return, the girl thought highly of Hector and felt a calm and easy connection with him with Hector. In contrast to her difficult and draining relationship with Alex, she finally felt the kind of attention a true man ought to give a woman. They became quite close and often shared tea in his kitchen while conversing about a wide range of subjects. Diana even found the bravery to tell him about her condition and the reasons she was in the neighborhood. She was afraid of being judged for being a Divorcee and his mistress while feigning to be involved with a married man. Hector, on the other hand, adopted a more philosophical approach. Admitting that everyone makes mistakes, has secrets, and occasionally behaves cruelly. He reminded her that it was important that she understood the issue. But also stressed that people had a tendency to give in to weakness and temptation. He encouraged her to stop dwelling on self-blame. 
and praised her for escaping the triangle and beginning over. He talked about how he thought he would never be able to love again. Reflecting on his own experience following Veronica's passing. But when he met Diana. He was drawn to her in a magnetic way and expressed his wish to be near her. Providing support. Safety. And the satisfaction of taking care of her. Feeling touched by his remarks. Diana awkwardly went out to kiss Hector. Feeling vulnerable and with her pulse pounding. Immediately. The man scooped her into his arms and spun her around. Hugging her tenderly as he carried her to the bedroom's bed. Hector phoned her with such care and sensitivity. That Diana had an overwhelming rush of joy. The moment he murmured words of love into her ear. They were a couple. Their love was calm. Strong. And unflinching. Diana knew that when things became tough. Hector would be there for her. Providing constant support. Shielding. And help. From that day on. Linda. Eric. And Max were invited by Diane and Xenia. To live with them in their beautiful house. Where they enjoyed cookouts. Lounging on Shay's lounge. And sipping aromatic wine. After years apart. The sisters who were almost inseparable, tried to make up for lost time by calling each other, non-stop and seeking advice on everything. Linda's expertise was in art history and design. Therefore she was curious about the nurse's management of her profession given that it was historically viewed as a male domain. Their contrasts in temperament, Diana being aggressive, strong, and stubborn, while Linda was gentler and more obedient, did not prevent them from having a close friendship and emotional love for one another. Soon after, as a suitable monument to their strong relationship, Diana and Hector got married in front of Linda and Eric. An invitation to the event was sent to Veronica as well. Notwithstanding the difficulties, she took Linda's position as her mother. And despite the difficulties, especially for Linda. Both sisters mustered the will to forgive her. Linda and Diane worked together to commission. A stunning memorial honoring their parents. Now. Both families often paid a visit to the sisters' parents' cemetery. Exchanging meaningful words with their loved ones. The inscription said. To daddy and mommy. From our loving daughters. We remember. We love. We mourn. Diane and Linda were happy with how everything had turned out for them and firmly felt that their parents could see them from heaven. Diana was welcomed by a big, kind family after Hector arranged a chance meeting with an abandoned home. She found a new sister and became a happy wife. She could not have imagined being happier than she was. Their only hope left was to have a child who would succeed Hector. But they knew that would not be the end of their quest.